Okay, um, welcome uh, everyone. This is uh, Nicola Marzari uh, speaking from Lausanne in Switzerland. That's where EPFL is, uh, one of the two federal universities in Switzerland. And uh, it's the first of uh, three webinars uh, that will be streamed. Uh, one is today, the next one is tomorrow at the same time, uh, and the last one will be on Friday. Uh, these webinars are being recorded uh, and they will be uploaded uh, to the Learn section of uh, the Materials Cloud. Uh, there are actually uh, four panelists, five panelists with me. They are all from the group, uh, from the Theory and Simulation groups here at EPFL. Uh, Antimo Marazzo, Marco Borelli, Marco Vanzini, Samuel Ponce and Francesco Libbi. Uh, they will be monitoring uh, the chat. Uh, we are so many that uh, uh, we cannot really have uh, questions live, uh, but you are welcome to write your questions into the chat. They'll capture those, uh, we'll uh, write the answer in a PDF file, and that will also be uploaded uh, in the learner section. So let me start. Uh, what is the goal of uh, these uh, three webinars? Uh, uh, well, the first one, the one of today, is dedicated to the fundamental of electronic structure and explaining to you what density functional theory is. The one of tomorrow is a very practical one, is what I call density functional practice, uh, and it will be actually dedicated to understanding how you perform a calculation using uh, what is called the total energy plane wave uh, pseudo-potential method. Uh, that is uh, very popular these days in science and technology. And there will be also a handout uh, for uh, some quantum mechanical simulations that you could do on your own uh, using an open source code, Quantum Espresso. Uh, and actually there is even a virtual machine that you can download. So everyone, no matter what computer you have, if it's Windows, or Linux or Unix, um, you can just uh, download the virtual machine and run the code in that uh, environment. And then uh, the third webinar on Friday uh, will really be dedicated uh, to the scientists that are interested in understanding uh, what can uh, be done with density functional theory, what are the properties that are accessible to density functional theory, how expensive they are to calculate, uh, what are the properties uh, that are not uh, accessible uh, to density functional theory and uh, we'll see a number of applications and a number of uh, these challenges. If you're interested in all of this and we might try to do some more, uh, you're also welcome uh, to subscribe. Uh, we'll keep a mailing list uh, for these webinars. Uh, so here below is uh, the link. Uh, you would just uh, input uh, your uh, email uh, and that link you can find it in the news section and in the learn section of the materials cloud website okay so let's get uh, let's get started and uh, i would suggest uh, to the panelists uh, uh, raise a hand uh, or send me a message or even give me a call if something uh, is going wrong because i'll probably be focused uh, on, on on talking so let me start uh, with uh, uh, a very broad introduction about uh, you know the relevance of density functional theory in uh, science and uh, technology and I'll start from this. Uh, this is a, a paper that came out in Nature uh, in October 2014. It was called the Paper Mountain, the top 100 papers. They looked at, uh, at all the scientific, medical, engineering, uh, biological literature, anything that has been uh, published, uh, and they looked uh, at the articles uh, that were most cited. You know, one of these uh, bibliometric exercises. And they went back uh, to the 17th century, to the proceeding of the Royal Society, to, you know, today, 2014, and they looked at the uh, 100 most cited papers. And, you know, you could imagine to find their DNA and cancer and, you know, major accomplishments, Nobel Prizes, but actually the field that was uh, most uh, represented uh, with the 12 most cited papers in those top 100 and two in the top 10 uh, was actually density functional theory. That tells you uh, what is really the impact of, uh, you know, this kind of calculations in the entire world of science and technology. If you take physics and if you take uh, the Journal of the American Physical Society, it's even more remarkable. This is an exercise that I did last year when I 
visited actually the APS headquarters. So, so I looked at, you know, physical review letters, physical review B, and so on and so forth. And these are the most cited papers in the entire history of the American Physical Society. So more than 120 years. And the one in red are all about electronic structure simulation. Uh, there are 18 of those, so you see the top 15. Uh, one is the muller plesse paper about uh, uh, post artery fault perturbation theory. Everything else uh, is about uh, density functional theory. So you can see you know, how relevant uh, these calculations are, how uh, pervasive, and that's why I just wanted to give this introduction uh, to understand the fundamentals and to understand uh, what can and cannot uh, be done. These days, actually, there is uh, a lot of optimism in the capability of using uh, these calculations. So, uh, to predict uh, the properties of materials, maybe before even experiments or helping or accelerating uh, experiments. Uh, you might have heard of the Materials Genome Initiative. I like this quote from Barron's that's a, a US tech paper about a materials revolution where powerful simulation techniques uh, increase the computing power, machine learning uh, will automate uh, much of the discovery process. And uh, this is uh, actually, these are titles from some of the actually mostly nature scientific journals. You see a lot of optimism about the capability of uh, designing uh, materials with simulations. I love this uh, Gordon Reserves uh, Research Conference a title um, from a few years ago. Um, are experiments still necessary? And of course, the answer is yes. And actually, you know, we will not really invent any. Uh, physical phenomena that uh, is not uh, already contained in density functional theory with these uh, simulations. But this kind of simulation had a major impact earlier on in high pressure physics uh, because it's so difficult uh, to do experiments at high pressure. And actually, you know, our capabilities to describe uh, condensed electrons are very good. So for us, it's very easy to turn the dial and, you know, have uh, all of a sudden 500 gigapascal uh, in our simulations. So, well, in order to do a proper gasket for a diamond navel cell, you really need to put an enormous amount of intelligence. And uh, we can also explore, and you'll see examples, uh, many different configurations, and so it becomes uh, easy to try and see what a material would want to do at uh, extreme conditions. And uh, you'll see a lot of examples, especially on Friday, of the capability of density functional theory. Uh, again, they are in part uh, driven uh, by the fact that the simulations these days uh, are very affordable. Uh, I love actually this little movie uh, that I did uh, 10 years ago in Oxford. That's my uh, Nokia uh, Linux uh, cell phone uh, running uh, Debian Linux. I installed Blast Lapak uh, FFTW uh, and I compiled the Quantum Espresso and you see it live in uh, 45 seconds uh, calculating the ground uh, state electronic structure of, uh, of silicon. Maybe the only important thing that uh, has happened in the last 10 years uh, that maybe uh, few uh, were imagining uh, 10 years ago uh, has been, uh, of course, uh, the uh, entrance uh, into the field uh, also of uh, ideas, uh, concepts, and tools uh, from computer science. Uh, that is, uh, data mining, uh, machine learning, uh, we'll mention that on Friday, uh, is becoming a great accelerator, uh, substituting also for quantum mechanical simulations. But uh, first and foremost, uh, this has been uh, the great accelerator. Uh, just uh, if we look at the capacity of digital computing, you all know how remarkable it has been. Uh, this is uh, uh, the list that is made every six months by the top 500 conference of uh, the most powerful uh, supercomputer in the world. That's the number one. Uh, and you see when it's flat, it means uh, it's the same that remains uh, for several periods of six months. And this red curve is a place where the US and China and Japan uh, joust for uh, attention. But both this red curve or uh, uh, the wooden spoon, uh, you know, the last one in the list, uh, the last computer, uh, and even the aggregate uh, capacity power of all the 500 computers in this list uh, that, that sits, uh, uh, that, uh, that is the, the, the blue line, they all sit uh, on a fairly straight line uh, that if I put together uh, the latest data as a slope uh, that corresponds uh, 
uh, to capacity doubling every six months. That means uh, you can you know, just not do anything, just sleep for six months, and after six months, uh, your house, your wealth, uh, your uh, laboratory has doubled uh, uh, just because uh, you know, the, the capacity of uh, digital computing. And uh, if this was a real world experiment, uh, let's say that you know, uh, to make a very complex experiment, uh, it would have taken you one year in 1988. Uh, well, today, uh, it will take you one second. So we have had a 32 million fold increase in the past uh, 32 years. And that's why these calculations that 20, 30 years ago were still exceedingly expensive to perform and only few supercomputer centers can afford the computing power needed, these days are uh, prevalent. And if you want the focus, uh, is uh, moving, in my opinion, from the hardware to the software. I put here two examples that are very dear to, my, to me because these are uh, open source codes uh, that uh, we develop or co-develop. The Quantum Espresso code is a team of uh, uh, developers based in Trieste, in Udine, but also here at EPFL in the United States. Uh, the Vanier code is especially dear to me because it all started uh, during uh, my postdoc. But you see, these are the number of uh, publications uh, that say, let's say, Quantum Espresso produces uh, every year. It's actually the most used open source code for materials. Uh, VASP is uh, even more used. That's uh, by now a, a commercial code, but it's really uh, rooted in academia. And you see, we're talking about uh, close to 3,000 uh, papers in a year. Uh, there are actually very few scientific installations uh, uh, in the world that produce that amount of papers. Uh, don't uh, quote me and don't record this, uh, but uh, if you go to the CERN website, I did, uh, I think, a year ago, in 2018, uh, they had uh, 900 papers and 900 preprints. Uh, and of course, you know, they have also a number of Nobel Prizes and super important science, uh, but it's actually amazing uh, how much science uh, these open source uh, uh, tools uh, empower, and it's science uh, that can be distributed uh, worldwide uh, to everyone at no cost. So that's why I'm a strong uh, believer uh, in this uh, model of doing science uh, and this, this model of open computational science. Okay, this was my introduction. Let's now go into the topic of uh, the tutorial. And the first, uh, just to make sure we are all uh, on the same footing, uh, I have to teach you quantum mechanics uh, or uh, refresh you uh, uh, the fundamental ideas of quantum mechanics. I'll take five minutes. Uh, I remember there, is, uh, there used to be a beautiful show in London uh, uh, given by the reduced uh, Shakespeare company. I think in 90 minutes they did all the plays of Shakespeare. So if they can do all of Shakespeare in 90 minutes, I think I can give you quantum mechanics uh, in, uh, five, uh, in five minutes. And uh, let's get started, and this is actually a very nice uh, story. This is uh, probably one of the shortest uh, PhD theses ever. This is uh, uh, Louis de Broglie in Paris uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, um, figuring out uh, that uh, there is a fundamental uh, constant of nature and a fundamental relation uh, that tells us uh, that objects uh, that starts to have a very small mass, a very small momentum, uh, start acquiring uh, wave-like wave -like characteristics. So you see, the Broly wrote is an equation that says uh, everything in life, uh, so it could be an electron, an atom, a basketball, myself, uh, a Ferrari car, uh, any object uh, that has a certain momentum, uh, mass times velocity, p, as a wave-like uh, character uh, with a wavelength uh, lambda uh, that is uh, established by this relation, the product of the wavelength uh, times the momentum is equal to the Planck constant in the international system is 6.6 .6 times to the minus 34 joules per second. In the system of atomic units uh, that we'll use later on, is a bit easier to remember, is just a two times pi. What does this mean? It means that as you get uh, lighter, as your momentum gets smaller, your wavelength uh, gets uh, larger. And now, of course, uh, uh, what happens uh, is that if you are a car or a basketball or myself uh, or even a virus these days, uh, 
Well, your wavelength uh, is still very, very tiny. But as you go lighter and lighter, you go to a small molecule, you go to an atom, you go to a nucleus, uh, well, this wavelength uh, starts becoming larger and larger. <coughs> and almost magically, when you skip uh, from a, a proton to an electron, uh, that last, uh, you know, factor of uh, 1,800 times uh, in the mass, uh, what happens is that now lambda has become large enough uh, that starts to be comparable between uh, the distance uh, between the atoms, that is, of the order of a few angstroms. Uh, and all of a sudden, the wave-like uh, characteristics uh, of the electrons uh, becomes relevant. Uh, and the wave-like uh, characteristic of everything else that we encounter normally, even something as light as a proton, the nuclei, and you know, more massive objects, uh, are almost always irrelevant. Uh, they almost always is a caveat that I'll explain later on. But somehow, at the conditions of temperature and pressure at which we live, uh, we are in a situation in which uh, the wave-like behavior of electron is very important, uh, and the wave-like uh, behavior of everything else is uh, almost always uh, uh, not important. But the issue is that uh, uh, if you behave uh, as a wave, uh, you start uh, you know, having, uh, giving rise to diffraction phenomena. This is uh, a very beautiful visualization of the wave function of an electron. You see that there's a certain typical wavelength uh, going through a double slit opening. And you see as this electron goes through, well, it goes through not one of the openings, but it goes through two of the openings simultaneously. And actually, parts of this uh, wave function on the left and the uh, right uh, parts uh, actually interfere constructively or destructively with each other. And so if I were to sit uh, here and uh, look uh, at the wave function and uh, measuring uh, the electron on a detector given by this uh, red line, I would actually see a modulation in the probability of finding the electron uh, that comes uh, from this uh, interference phenomena. So if you want, uh, quantum mechanics uh, is very much about understanding uh, the wave-like uh, character of uh, quantum objects uh, with the right equation. And uh, to get the right equation, well, we need to go to Switzerland. You know, this is, you know, one of my lovely stories. Uh, special relativity was invented by Albert Einstein in 1905 uh, in Bern. And quantum mechanics was also invented in Switzerland, in particular on the 27th of December 1925. So uh, Erwin Schrödinger, the Austrian physicist, uh, used to leave everyone, uh, wife, lover, and disappear for his Christmas holidays. Uh, uh, typically at a Villa Arosa. Arosa is uh, in the Italian-speaking uh, part of Switzerland. Uh, sadly, doesn't exist anymore. Uh, we don't know with whom he was spending the Christmas holidays. Maybe it's not so important. But certainly being uh, in a beautiful place, and you'll see example later on, uh, gets you inspired. And you see what he wrote in a letter, uh, not in English, by the way, he was Austrian, so he would uh, write in uh, German. Uh, but I translated it for you. It says, uh, uh, at the moment, I'm struggling with a new atomic theory. I'm very optimistic about this thing, and if I can only solve it, it will be very beautiful. And he was right uh, to be optimistic. That's really the birth of uh, quantum mechanics. And uh, solving it is a different matter, and uh, we'll try to see it. Uh, but uh, what is this equation? Where uh, for uh, one electron, uh, this is the equivalent uh, of the second uh, law of motion of Newton. Uh, you know, that tells us how macroscopic object uh, moves uh, in the presence uh, of uh, a force. Uh, so what is its acceleration? And uh, for a quantum mechanical object that is uh, a wave, uh, we are going to understand how the amplitude psi of the wave, and it's a little bit more complicated than a wave. So this is a complex amplitude how that amplitude evolves in a, a space and how it evolves in a time with this time-dependent shading equation for only one electron, where the important terms are this second derivative, the Laplacian is measuring what is the curvature of this wave function field. And then this is the external potential, typically, it will be the Coulombic attraction that the electron feels with the nuclei. We'll discuss that. 
Uh, and you see what we relate here is the second derivative of the wave function, so derivative uh, with respect to space, a potential that is just uh, multiplying uh, the wave function and in principle depends on position and uh, on time. We'll see later, keep this in mind, uh, we'll see later what happens when this uh, potential does not depend on time or it's very slow. Uh, and uh, this uh, curvature and this effect of potential uh, is related to the change in time of the wave function. Now, the first thing that you should notice is that uh, this is much more complex uh, than sending people to the moon, uh, where we just have to integrate uh, Newton's equation of motion. So we don't have to take into account uh, for a particle just uh, the position and the velocity of the position of or momentum as a function of time, so six uh, scalar fields, uh, but uh, for uh, uh, an electron for something that thanks to the Broglie relation is uh, quantum, uh, we need to understand what that amplitude is at every point in space and at every instant in time. So there is an information challenge that we'll describe later on that is uh, very important and makes actually the solution of the quantum mechanics equation uh, much more uh, difficult. Uh, now here, uh, let me actually, as I said, uh, make uh, this uh, simplification in which uh, the potential does not uh, depend, uh, sorry, does not depend uh, anymore on time. So we consider uh, a potential uh, that uh, is uh, mm, static or it's uh, mm, changing very slow uh, with the time. So the, the dependence on t in v has uh, disappeared. And so what happens uh, is that uh, we can actually make an ansatz. Uh, we can uh, write uh, the wave function uh, through separation of variables uh, as uh, a position dependent, uh, this could be r, a position dependent part, and uh, uh, a time dependent part, f. And if we put uh, this ansatz uh, into the time dependent Schrodinger equation, uh, what we find out is that that equation is uh, satisfied uh, if uh, the psi is such that uh, its decomposition in phi and f satisfies uh, these uh, uh, two differential uh, equations. Uh, one for the space dependent part of the wave function for the phi of r, uh, and that is called uh, the stationary uh, Schrodinger equation and another one uh, that depends only on time. Now there's, uh, uh, you know, we have equation number one, the stationary uh, Schrodinger equation, and uh, uh, equation number two. Uh, equation number two is uh, very, very easy to solve uh, because it's going to be uh, just uh, an imaginary exponential uh, for any value of e. Uh, so that uh, f of t, is actually present uh, in the full uh, wave function, uh, but it's very trivial to find. And uh, in general, it will not come into play into any observable for our systems uh, because when we calculate uh, the expectation value of any operator in the form of psi a h psi or psi a, a psi, uh, that f term uh, will uh, cancel out because it will multiply itself as being the only time dependent term and we have uh, the term and its complex conjugate so it gives us a factor of one. So what is really important and what is really difficult and even for uh, one electron uh, uh, you know will be a difficult differential equation to solve is the number one equation is the uh, stationary equation. And again uh, here uh, what I've uh, done I've made this assumption that only electrons are the quantum mechanical objects that are interesting, and that even when we study, say, you know, maybe a drop of water with all the molecules moving around, the potential that all those oxygen nuclei and all those hydrogen nuclei are generating as they move around, you know, maybe this is a liquid droplet, is in any case uh, reasonably slow, so we can actually neglect uh, its time uh, dependence. So this is uh, what is called, uh, in generic term, the adiabatic or Born-Oppenheimer approximation. Actually, these uh, two terms uh, mean two slightly different things, 
but basically what we are thinking is that if capital R of I are the position of my nuclei uh, around which the electron are attracted and this nuclei are moving around, uh, we really don't have to worry about, say, the uh, velocity and uh, the electron, uh, that is the wave function psi for the electron, always uh, rearranges, rearranges itself uh, to solve the Schrodinger equation, or we'll see it later through the variational principle, to minimize uh, the energy functional for that given configuration of uh, the position. And there is uh, my last, uh, say, Swiss uh, uh, example, and it's the one of a cow. We have a lot of cows here, and it's a cow with the flies. This is actually due to uh, Nicola Bonini in King's College. And the idea is that uh, the cow is the nucleus and the flies are the electrons. And no matter how fast uh, the cow might try to run, uh, the flies uh, that are much faster uh, will always follow it uh, as if nothing were to happen. And so the electron, uh, no matter uh, what the nuclei are trying to do, are going uh, to follow them uh, as if they had no velocity because they can always uh, rearrange themselves uh, instantaneously at their ground state uh, just because uh, they are so light and so fast. Now, this adiabatic approximation is what we'll use uh, uh, for the entire tutorial, but let me give you actually a few examples where this uh, are actually approximation that starts failing. Uh, this is actually a nice one, and this is looking at something that you can measure very well. You can measure uh, with Raman spectroscopy the vibrational uh, frequency uh, of certain phonons, in this case, uh, zone center phonons in graphene and uh, what uh, the calculation in different flavors uh, uh, would predict uh, for those uh, frequency as a function of uh, doping uh, in the Born-Oppenheimer approximation are, uh, are, are given by this line depending on the details of the calculation. But uh, what happens uh, uh, as you dope the material, as you dope graphene and you look at those uh, phonon frequency, is that you start uh, to have uh, uh, a lot of uh, very viscous electrons uh, uh, um, around uh, the Fermi energy. And when you shake around uh, the atoms uh, and these uh, electrons are being uh, shaken around, uh, they don't uh, rearrange themselves uh, instantaneously to the ground state. And so there starts to be uh, a relevant uh, time-dependent effect uh, that you can only capture if you go beyond the standard uh, adiabatic uh, Born-Oppenheimer approximation. Other examples that are just interesting to mention and that are relevant is that, uh, say, protons, so that is nuclei that are very light, uh, you know, they are only, you know, 1,800 times uh, heavier uh, than an electron, uh, might have uh, some uh, uh, wave-like uh, behavior. And uh, here we are actually looking at how a proton goes back and forth uh, uh, between uh, two water molecules. Uh, and the behavior and the barrier that it sees is different if that proton behaves as a classical particle or if it behaves as it does as a true quantum particle. So, and you see how the barrier in this case for this process that admittedly was very tiny but is reduced by a factor of three. Another example that I like very much comes from the world of ferroelectrics. This is a, a perovskite, a strontium titanate, you see the titanium, the big cation here in the center. You see the oxygen atoms. And actually there is a, a large difference in the polarization in this system as a function of temperature. Uh, not at high temperature where the system is parelectric, but at low temperature where the system would you know, look like it has a ferroelectric phase transition. But that ferroelectric phase transition is actually inhibited by the capabilities of the oxygen atoms to tunnel back and forth through the bistable uh, two possible ferroelectric states because they see a very shallow barrier and so they behave as quantum particle. Uh, the oxygen cages tunnels between all possibilities, actually all six possibilities, and at the end you never see ferroelectricity 
as the Lanzian titanate behaves as what is called a quantum paraelectric. Another favorite example of mine, this is Olaf here doing uh, the experiment, uh, is uh, actually that, you know, if you're very good and you're able to cool down even a molecule as large as C60, this is, you know, the Fuller in the soccer ball molecule, well, you can see interference effects uh, for the molecules uh, going through a diffraction grating. Uh, that means that the molecule has not uh, gone through that slit, it's like the double slit I was showing before as a classical object, but has gone through as a quantum object interfering uh, with itself uh, past, uh, uh, past uh, the grating. Other examples, this will be very important. I will see them in, uh, on Friday. And uh, in order to understand the thermomechanical properties of materials, that is, in order to understand how do they respond to temperature, how their lattice parameter changes, maybe they expand, maybe they become softer. Uh, in order to understand this, uh, we need to understand how temperature populates the vibration of the atoms, and actually the vibrational degrees of freedom uh, um, satisfy uh, Bose-Einstein statistics. And that uh, really means that at low temperature, you struggle with the very uh, small amount of uh, energy that you have lying around at exciting, say, any of those harmonic oscillators. We'll see that in detail in their first excited states. So the material uh, is... Uh, unable uh, to absorb uh, a lot of heat, so its uh, heat capacity is actually very low, and you see here the deviation uh, from the Dulong and Petit law, from the equipartition of the temperature and all the possible degrees of freedom, uh, that comes uh, exactly because of quantum mechanic effects on the nuclei, and in particular the fact that the statistical mechanics of their vibration is not a classical Maxwell-Boltzmann statistical mechanics, uh, but uh, it is uh, a mm, Bose-Einstein quantum mechanics of indistinguishable bosons. Uh, the, last, uh, the last example, uh, we are looking at an atom. Here we have an atom in green uh, that is uh, impinging on a metal surface. We are looking at an atom that is uh, electronegative, so it's happy to, you know, rip away uh, an electron from uh, the metal. Uh, this could be oxygen falling on uh, aluminum. Maybe it's not an atom, maybe it's a molecule, an oxygen uh, molecule. And here there is a fantastic animation of the atom falling on uh, the metal surface. Uh, what is interesting now is looking at this uh, curve uh, where on the y-axis, I have the energy um, as a function of uh, distance. Huh? So this was uh, the distance here. So this is called a potential energy surface. So we are looking at the energy of the system depending on the distance uh, of the atom from uh, the surface. And uh, if uh, the atom falls uh, on the surface uh, very slowly, uh, what will happen is that for every instantaneous position of the atom, uh, the electrons are in the lowest possible configuration. And so you'll see it later, there will be a crossing point uh, where the empty lumo of the atom starts to become the generator uh, with the Fermi energy of the metal. It was uh, above it uh, when it, the atom was more distant. As the atom comes closer, the LUMO starts to be the generator with the work function, and then it's lower. So electrons move from the atom, from the metal to the atom, and they fill up that LUMO uh, that becomes now the highest occupied uh, level in that atom, although it's now well below uh, the, Fermi, the Fermi energy. And so what uh, will happen, if you want, is the electronic configuration of the atom uh, has uh, changed, and so the form of the potential energy surface has changed. And maybe it has happened when it was here at this position here. Uh, what we had is that the electron was maybe harpooned, uh, and uh, we had all of a sudden a minus here, 
and uh, the metal you could have considered M plus. So we have switched from this curve for the two neutral subsystem to this curve where we are looking at the negatively charged atom uh, falling onto the surface that has lost an electron. But uh, if uh, you know we had a jet of atoms uh, that were uh, very fast, uh, well, maybe that uh, what would happen is that rather than following this potential surface, it wouldn't give time to the electron to jump from the metal to the atom. And so it would happily stay on the same potential energy surface that actually at the minimum, it's even in a configuration where it could sort of decay into different configuration by creating an electron hole pair. These are all known adiabatic effects that can be extremely important. And for the time being, for today, we are not going to consider. So really, this is what we are going to consider for today. We are going to consider a collection of not only atoms, but in general, electrons and nuclei. So, you know, you can think everything you're looking, you know, it's made of atoms. When I see this, I see the dance of Shiva, I see all the very massive nuclei where all the mass or you know 99.9% .9 of the mass sits, all the positive charge sits with the proton and the electrons around uh, wave, uh, wave like. And if we want to describe this system in the adiabatic approximation, uh, this is the Hamiltonian operator uh, that we are dealing with. It has uh, five th terms. Um, three are actually quantum mechanical. They depend uh, on the wave-like uh, property of the electron. We'll see them in a moment. Uh, one is the simple, because it's what is called a one-body operator, is the quantum kinetic energy of the electrons. The second term has to do with the interaction of each and every electron with each and every nucleus. The third term is actually the difficult one, is the term where we consider the interaction of, the, of every electron with every other electron. Now, because the Coulombic interaction repulsion is a two-body term, but here is a two-body quantum mechanical term, this is what makes the Schrodinger equation for many electrons uh, very difficult. And uh, I've written them here explicitly. You see what we have is that uh, the one body quantum kinetic energy is just a sum of Laplacian. I switch to atomic units. So very conveniently in atomic units, uh, H bar is equal to one. Remember H is equal to two pi. The mass of the electron is equal to one. So that uh, H bar square over two M factor of the Schrodinger equation in the international system has just become uh, uh, one half. And uh, then uh, what I take is the Laplacian uh, with respect to every electronic uh, coordinate in uh, the many body wave function. We'll see that uh, in a moment. And then when, what I have is that uh, every electron, this uh, I lowercase is a sum for every electron. So every electron fills every nucleus. So this uh, potential this would be typically a Coulombic attraction that is centered at the capital Ri, where each of the nuclei I sits. And depending if it's a Coulombic attraction, it just depends on one over the distance. So it depends on one over the absolute value of that vector difference. So this is the electron nucleus interaction. It's still simple because every electron just feels an electrostatic potential coming from the point like a collection of nuclei. What is difficult is this. This is what makes life in some ways interesting is the two body term where you see this is a way to sum. There is another way to sum where we could take one half over all possible I or J. So we are taking all the possible two-body electron-electron interaction. You understand right away, if you have uh, three electrons, uh, you need to look at the distance between uh, one and two, and then two and three, and you don't have uh, to count uh, 
3 and 2 and 2 and 1, and so you have also 1 and 3. So you have only three terms and not six, and that's why you can either write it as a sum over all possible i and j with a factor of one half, or a sum over all possible i for j greater than i. But this is what makes life difficult and interesting. So, you know, think for a moment, if you are in a crowd, if you are in a movie theater, if you are in a classroom, suddenly now we are all separated, but no matter what, you know, there are seven billion people, if we were all electron, as soon as one of the seven billion people moves his or her hand, everyone feels it. So everyone feels everyone else, of course, with an intensity that decreases with distance, but this is what gives rise to the collective and correlated complexity of the many body problem. The electrons feel instantaneously everyone else and they readjust. And that's why I say uh, correlation, if you take something as simple as a helium atom with two electrons, uh, you would find that the probability of finding two electrons uh, close by is actually much less likely than the probability of finding them uh, far apart uh, because being uh, close by is a very repulsive, you see there is a positive sign there, uh, interaction. And so this uh, correlation is actually something very subtle and very difficult to get, and uh, some of the techniques uh, that we'll see will only be able uh, to capture that uh, in part. But that's also what makes life uh, interesting, so you don't get anything for nothing. The last uh, two terms uh, are uh, uh, very boring, uh, but very important. Uh, you know, Tn is the classical kinetic energy of the nuclei. Uh, there is a big difference if the glass of water you're drinking is at uh, 30 Celsius or 100 Celsius in one case. Uh, you don't really feel well, in the other you sort of feel much better. So uh, it's not difficult to describe, it's just uh, one half uh, the mass times the square of the velocity of the nuclei, but could be very relevant uh, if we are studying, say again, our uh, water droplet. And equally well, the electrostatic, because now these nuclei are not quantum, are just uh, classical particles uh, between the nuclei, if we want to understand uh, if uh, just a hydrogen molecule stays together, you know, we need to take into account the fact that the two nuclei repel each other, the electron repel each other correlated and quantum mechanically, the electrons are attracted to the nuclei, there is a quantum kinetic energy, and uh, all these uh, five terms uh, will contribute to the Hamiltonian and then to the energy, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian that will tell me if this molecule wants to stay together, maybe at a certain distance, how much does it cost to stretch it? So what is its harmonic frequency? How much it costs to dissociate? So the blue terms are difficult, the, especially the electron-electron term is very, very difficult, and the blue, sorry, the black terms, and the blue terms are, 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 are easy. Now, first and foremost, the problem in going from one electrons to many electrons is actually an informational problem. I, I love this, this part. So, you know, what used to be a complex field, maybe not even at every instant, I say we are just looking here at the stationary part of the wave function, but what was a complex field at every place in space, for one electron now has become a complex field function of uh, uh, how many electrons uh, we have. And uh, Douglas Hartree, that, uh, that uh, we'll see it uh, again, you know, took the example of uh, an iron atom. Iron uh, is nice. It's, uh, you know, if a meteorite falls onto your head, uh, if you're lucky, it's going to be made of, of iron. Is uh, you know, one of the heaviest uh, common elements uh, that is uh, produced in uh, you know, nucleosynthesis inside, uh, inside stars. So uh, if you take an iron atom, it has uh, 26 uh, electrons. So now all of a sudden, my wave function, psi, for this 26 electron, is a function of uh, 26 uh, uh, vectorial coordinates in three dimension, or if you want, uh, is a function of uh, 78. I've multiplied it by three. Uh, scalar coordinates. So it would be x1, y1, z1, 
x2, y2, and so on and so forth. So how can we store, say, on a computer a complex field? So the amplitude of psi, that is a complex uh, number, uh, it typically needs eight bytes, uh, 16 bytes in double precision as a function of uh, those uh, 78 uh, uh, scalar coordinates. And Hartley said, well, let's really make a very pathetic uh, approximation where we slice uh, the little box uh, where my iron atom lives uh, in uh, 10 uh, slices. So I just uh, needed to give, uh, you know, 10 values uh, for x1, 10 values for y1, 10 values for z1, and so on and so forth. You know, how many numbers do I have? Well, you understand that if I have an election, I have to give 1,000 complex numbers because x1 can take 10 values, y1 can take 10 values, z1 can take 10 values. So one electron is 1,000 possibilities, 1,000 complex number, piece of cake these days. Two electrons starts to be a million. Three electron is already more complex depending if you are American or English, you could call it a billion, or maybe we need to go to four electrons to get a billions, but you know, 10 to the third, 10 to the sixth, 10 to the ninth, 10 to the 12, by the time we have 26 electron, uh, we have 10 to the 78 possible entries that I think is more than the number of atoms in the universe. So even for a humble iron atom, uh, we don't have the capability to represent uh, this very complex object. And this is, uh, this is what uh, kills us, and that's why uh, we need to find uh, better ways. So there are, we will not see them in uh, this uh, webinar, so there are stochastic approaches uh, like uh, Quantum Monte Carlo that tries to capture in statistical ways uh, all these complexities, uh, and uh, there are uh, systematic approaches uh, based on different uh, perturbative expansions like full configuration interaction that tries to capture this complexity but you can see how you know the full accuracy uh, is very elusive here so how do we make uh, progress well we use the fact that uh, every time uh, we have a differential equation uh, we have a, a variational principle and that's very useful and that's very powerful so here I defined my functional. What is a functional is a, you know, a relation that eats, in this case, a function or our wave function psi, a input, and gives us a number, in this case, a real number as output. So this is the energy of our system as a function of what the wave function psi is, is defined as the expectation value. This is the rack bracket notation if we were in a simple, you know, scalar vectorial case, Hilbert space, it would be psi star h psi integrated. And uh, just for the, you know, sake of convenience, uh, we have not even normalized uh, the wave function. You know, the integral of uh, psi star psi, since that uh, psi star psi is the probability of finding the electron or that electronic configuration somewhere, when you integrate it over all of the possibilities needs to be equal to one. Here, we don't even ask for that because we just put the normalization factor in the denominator. So this is general, doesn't have to do, doesn't deal necessarily with the Schrodinger equation. Every time you have a differential equation, you can write an equivalent variational principle. And what it says, is that uh, we can throw to this uh, E of psi, to this functional, uh, whatever wave function we want, uh, we can make it uh, psi very simple, very complex, we can concoct uh, anything, uh, and no matter what we concoct, uh, we'll never be able to get an expectation value on the normalized wave function that is lower than the ground state energy E0. And so that's great for a lot of things. So we could, you know, just very rudimentally try to solve a quantum mechanical problem, not by solving Schrodinger equation, but by just uh, constructing some uh, parametric uh, wave function, throwing them into the functional and changing the parameters 
until uh, we minimize that expectation value. And that uh, we think that parametric form will be our best guess uh, for the ground state energy. If we are very good in choosing either a very flexible or a very physical variational form, uh, we are going to be able to actually uh, get very close to the ground state. If we are Robert Laughlin, we can even explain uh, the quantum mole effect uh, with uh, such an ansatz. But uh, we'll use it in a moment uh, to try and make some progress uh, in solving uh, the Schrodinger equation. Uh, a little corollary for uh, you know non-degenerate case is also that uh, if uh, the expectation value that is the functional gives me exactly the ground state energy that I actually don't know, so it's not super useful, uh, then the wave function psi is the ground state wave function and uh, uh, vice versa. How do we make progress? So uh, 1925, uh, Schrodinger went skiing in a rosa, came back uh, with the Schrodinger equation, and then uh, Douglas Hartree, that uh, was a chemist at the University of Cambridge, uh, tried to, you know, deal with this uh, complexity of this uh, many body wave function and said that, uh, well, it, we are lost, you know, that statement was from him before even for an iron atom. We have 10 to the 78 variables for a very poor uh, sampling. Uh, let's try to deal uh, with something uh, that uh, is uh, uh, much more uh, uh, numerically, analytically, or computationally tractable. That is, say, so let's make an ansatz, let's make an hypothesis, and that's an approximate one in general, that uh, this uh, very complex uh, wave function psi can be written actually as uh, the product of n, we call them single particle wave function, phi 1, phi 2, phi n. And you see right away for our iron atom, here with poor sampling, we have to specify 10 to the 78 complex number. What is the complexity here on the right? Well, it's much simpler because, you know, in order to represent phi 1, now we just need 1,000 complex number. And here we have 1,000 complex number, and here we have 1,000 complex number, so we have gone from 10 to the 78 to 26 times 10 to the 3. And the complexity is linear scaling. If I double the size of my system, uh, I double, let's say, the number of electrons in my system, I double the computational complexity, while before it was exponentially exploding. So much, much better, even my cell phone, or maybe even myself with a bit of training I can deal with 26,000 numbers. So what's the next step? Well, Hartree, you know, was very good at differential equations. We'll see why in a moment. He asks himself, so in new functional analysis, uh, what are the conditions that uh, this uh, 26 uh, phi i needs to satisfy uh, such that the so-called functional derivative, I'm assuming here, real orbitals uh, for simplicity, uh, that is uh, the change in that uh, functional where the psi is just a product of my 26 uh, orbitals uh, with respect uh, to phi i is equal to zero. So that's a minimum condition. So I know that I have to minimize the energy, I need to minimize that functional from the variational principle, and now I'm asking myself, uh, what are the conditions uh, that the phi i from 1 to 26 needs to satisfy such that the psi that is approximated as a product of those 26 phi i minimizes the variational uh, principles. Well, those 26 conditions are actually 26 differential equations. So Hartree went from one Schrodinger equation on an impossible wave function psi to 26 uh, equations uh, on uh, a Schrodinger-like equation. Uh, it's called actually the Hartree equations. They are written here, the Hartree equations, on much, much uh, simpler objects, uh, that is, onto my single particle objects. So what do these Hartree equations tell me is that uh, each uh, electron, 
phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, satisfy a Schrodinger-like equation where they feel uh, the quantum kinetic energy, they feel the external potential of all the nuclei, and this is the fun term, uh, this here uh, is called the Hartree operator. Uh, if you look at it, uh, you realize uh, what it is. Uh, this Hartree operator represents uh, the Coulombic uh, repulsion uh, for electron I coming uh, from all the other electron J. So if I'm electron one, I see the Coulombic repulsion from all the other uh, 25 electron in an average way. So this is, uh, you know, the probability of finding uh, an electron, in this case, electron J somewhere. So that is the charge density, actually, of uh, electron J. I call it uh, rho J. And here you see rho J divided by the distance. So this is the Coulombic uh, potential. So the Hartree operator represents uh, the Coulombic repulsion from every other electron. We have lost in this uh, the concept of correlation because you see, you suppose for a moment, uh, you know, you, each one of you is one of the 26 electrons in the iron atom. And uh, what we are, you know, starting to study is uh, we study maybe the first of these 26 electrons. Uh, what we are looking is uh, at the average repulsion through the charge density uh, uh, rho j of every other electron. So suppose you know that you are like me sitting on the chair, it doesn't matter if instantaneously you move your arm because you are not going to act instantaneously on me. We lose the correlation. What only matters is your charge density. So what is your average probability may be taken in these two hours. And if I take the average of you over two hours, you look as a fuzzy blob and maybe some of you are already looking as a fuzzy blobs. Okay, so every electron acts in the differential equation to the electron that we are solving for. Here is electron I through its average probability that is through its charge density. So what we have gained is that now rather than having one impossible equation, we have 26, but a much easier equation, each of them you know, 10 to the three complex numbers rather than 10 to the 78. But it's an approximation. It's not going to be exact. So when it's something is an approximation, we always have, have to ask, is it good or is it not good? Before going into that, let me make uh, some comments about uh, this uh, 26 equation, because we'll see that over and over again, these equations have become uh, what we say self-consistent. That is, you see, to know what happens to electron i, so if I want to find phi i, I need to know what every electron j does. So I need to have the solution for every other electron to find what electron one does. And same for electron two, I need to know what electron one and electron three and electron four. And for electron three, I need to know what one and two and four. So it's, uh, you know, eating is tail, if you want. Uh, and uh, that really means uh, that in order to solve for one, uh, we need to know what is the solution for the others. But to find the solution for the others, we need to know what is the solution for one. And so typically, we do that uh, by iteration. We start uh, uh, with a guess of uh, what could be a good uh, solution. We start uh, with maybe some fi that are uh, let me just jump here and then I'll go back, uh, that are some good guesses, maybe what the electrons would do in an atom. With that guess, uh, we build uh, all the different Hartree operators. We solve this equation. Uh, with those solution, we now construct a new set of operators, new equation, we solve it and iterate it. So not only we have gone from one Schrodinger to 26 Hartree, but the 26 Hartree uh, we have to solve them over and over again. Still much, much better than solving the impossible one. Uh, as I said, you know, that the last uh, comment is that uh, this is what is called an independent particle model because uh, each electron feels uh, what we call an effective potential, a mean field potential that is just uh, 
the average effect of the repulsive interaction of the other electrons. Okay, I think this is a good moment to stop for five minutes so that you can catch your breath. So we'll start again in five minutes. It will be four or five. We briefly see Hartree-Fock and then we go into the theorem of density functional theory. So I'll mute myself for five minutes and maybe I'll mute also my image and see you in five minutes.
Okay, welcome uh, back uh, everyone. So I let you digest uh, the Hartree approach. Now, as I told you, Hartree was very good at uh, differential equation and integral differential equations because he actually studied uh, during World War I how to integrate the complex differential equation of uh, what happens uh, when you throw cannonballs in the presence of friction. So I guess they wanted to throw cannonball back and forth uh, across uh, uh, the channel. These were a bit uh, too difficult uh, for him. Uh, so for that, um, he really needed a, a computer. Being in 1927, uh, computer technology was uh, still uh, rudimentary. Actually, there were no computers as we understand them now. Uh, computers uh, at the time were mechanical objects. So this is actually a 1927 computer. It's called a differential analyzer. This one was built uh, at MIT and that's where Hartree went. Uh, they were the good computer scientists you see at the time uh, in order to solve uh, its uh, equation. Then in the 1930s, a computer uh, took a different name. A computer became a person that was doing a lot of calculations. And so during the war, in uh, the Second World War, in places like Los Alamos, you would have uh, rooms uh, full of computers that were people trying to solve the equation. Maybe you've seen the movie Hidden Figures. Uh, uh, and often, uh, you know, women, as in many other fields, uh, were much better than men at doing uh, this calculation. They were more accurate. Uh, and to be on the safe side, uh, there would be two different rooms uh, doing uh, the same calculations twice uh, to make sure that the results uh, was correct. So Hartree goes to the States, takes a boat, uh, solves the Hartree equation, thanks uh, to the differential analyzer that this gentleman here had uh, constructed. Um, his name is Vannevar Bush, um, no relation with the Bush family, he was uh, one of the great uh, scientists and engineers. Uh, and I start uh, lighthearted uh, with this uh, diversion on um, an article uh, that uh, he wrote in 1945. You see, that was uh, uh, still a world war, at least uh, for Japan and the US, um, called uh, As We May Think. And uh, I want to mention it here because I think it's actually incredibly remarkable. So no computers, no real, you know, electronic semiconductor uh, valve diode computers in 1945, no semiconductor electronics. But uh, here is Bush saying, uh, you know, the arithmetical machine of the future will perform complex computation at exceedingly high speeds and recall the results in form to be readily available for distribution or later manipulation. And then mathematics will become uh, effective in bringing the knowledge of, of atomistics uh, to the solution of problems in chemistry, metallurgy, and biology. You see what it means to have uh, a vision. Uh, these days there are a lot of people that have uh, hallucinations, uh, but Bush had uh, a vision. And now this is fantastic. This is, you know, it says uh, how we will work uh, in the future, and it says we will work with, with memex. A memex is a device, I think it's not a mechanical device, where we store all our book records and communication. Here is my memex, and which is mechanized, so it may be consulted with exceeding speed and flexibility. It's an enlarged intimate supplement to his memory, for those of you that want to know why DFT is like Tinder. So physically, it's made of a desk. Maybe it can be operated from a distance, but maybe it's a piece of furniture. There are slanting translucent screens and materials can be projected for convenient reading. Uh, there is a, a keyboard, uh, sets of buttons and levers. Uh, sadly, I don't have uh, any levers. And now this is amazing. Wholly new forms of encyclopedias uh, will appear, ready-made with a mess mesh of associative trails running through them. So the chemist or you know, the scientist, there's all the literature before him in his laboratory, they were all male at the time, sadly, uh, with trails uh, following the analogies of compounds and side trails to their physical and chemical behavior. You know, this is uh, Wikipedia, the internet, hyperlinks, uh, all wrapped in, uh, in once. So I get very excited when I talk about uh, Bush. 
done about it. This is it. This is the guy that created the National Science Foundation in the US, uh, for those of you that are into these things. Let's go back to Hartree. Hartree made a, you know, a terrible mistake uh, that luckily realized uh, quite soon, and not only him, but also Falkins and Petersburg, um, uh, maybe it was already Leningrad at the time, uh, 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 realized. And, uh, you know, he really made, uh, you know, a first year, uh, whatever, a BA student error. That is, uh, he had forgotten one of the fundamental uh, properties of quantum mechanics, uh, um, and that's the one where uh, wave function for many electrons uh, have uh, some fundamental symmetry properties. You can derive this from quantum field theory, but basically the property that he had forgotten is that uh, the wave function for the 26 electrons, 2,000 electrons, two electrons uh, needs to be totally anti-symmetric. You see, electrons, uh, first of all, are indistinguishable. So swapping one with the other, it shouldn't be distinguishable. Uh, but, uh, you know, what we have is that uh, when we calculate the expectation uh, values, uh, uh, that swap doesn't necessarily need to lead to an identity. You know, even a phase, or in this case, a minus one, uh, is also good because when you take the expectation value, um, what you get is the same expectation value because this two minus uh, will, uh, uh, cancel, uh, will cancel out. So he had forgotten to impose uh, this uh, symmetry property that we call total anti-symmetry, a good fermionic uh, wave function that is for a quantum particle that has a half integral spin, could be a muon, if you swap the two coordinates, uh, you need to change sign. And in passing, uh, we will not look at it uh, for bosons. So it's totally symmetric, uh, so you keep the same sign. And that really makes uh, quantum mechanics for bosons uh, a little bit easier. Suddenly, they are a little bit uh, less interesting. OK, he, you know, Hartree didn't uh, lost faith and said, well, I'm going to make a new ansatz. I'm going to approximate my wave function psi not uh, as a product of single particle orbitals, uh, but something uh, that is still uh, related to single particle orbitals, but rather than being uh, a product, uh, is uh, a sum over all the possible products uh, between all the possible combinations uh, with uh, the right sign so that the sum is totally anti-symmetric. And for those of you that are familiar with linear algebra, uh, you can just do that uh, by writing uh, your ansatz sub psi as a determinant uh, where uh, on the column, now you see on the first column, uh, we have the first orbital phi alpha, but as a function of uh, the different electronic variables. So we have 26 uh, vector variables, say for uh, our iron atom, we have 26 orbitals that go from phi alpha, phi beta, phi gamma, up to phi nu, although nu is not the 26th letter in the Greek alphabet, uh, sadly. I don't think the Greek alphabet gets to 26. I forgot, that maybe 25. And it's normalized uh, with one over uh, the square root uh, of the factorial. You, you see that uh, very easily for the case of uh, two electrons. Suppose that we have uh, two electrons. Uh, so this is R1 and R2. How do we write that? Is one over square root of two of uh, phi alpha R1, phi alpha R2 phi beta r1, phi beta r2, and this uh, Slater determinant, uh, J.C. Slater was a professor at MIT that uh, will come back uh, later on, you see is just equal to phi alpha r1, phi beta r2, minus phi beta r1, phi alpha r2. So you see, you see it right away that this is totally anti-symmetric. If I swap r1 and r2 in this uh, expression, my object uh, changes sign because basically the first term becomes the second and the second becomes the first. And uh, in general, a determinant uh, does uh, uh, that uh, automatically for uh, uh, all, uh, you know, the electrons uh, that you have. And uh, by the way, this is still how we think, uh, you know, if you think uh, at an atom in the periodic table, you're not thinking at the many-body wave function, you're thinking at the 
single orbitals, the 1s, the 2s, the 2p, and so on and so forth. So you assume that, uh, you know, your many body wave function for the 26 electrons of iron can actually be thought as a, a Slater determinant of the 26 orbitals, or, you know, 13 spin orbitals of, 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 your, of your problem. And by the way, from this, actually, you see right away uh, Pauli's uh, principle, because you know that a determinant uh, is zero if two columns are equal. So suppose that phi alpha is equal to phi beta. I'm not treating spin here to make things a bit simpler, but if phi alpha is equal to phi beta, these two columns are identical, the determinant is zero. So it's one way sort of hand waving to say that uh, two electrons uh, cannot sit uh, in the same quantum state. Anyhow, so one year has passed, uh, Hartree has been redeemed from his uh, approximate Hansatz uh, 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 hypothesis. He has made uh, a better hypothesis, focused on the same. And again, now with the you know, Hansatz uh, that uh, Psi is a Slater determinant, uh, we go back uh, to the variational principle. So that uh, is still true, and we look uh, at the conditions uh, that the 26 uh, phi i need to satisfy, or uh, let's call them phi lambda just to use the same notation here, the 26 uh, phi lambda needs to satisfy such that uh, the variational principle is satisfied. So again, you know, we transform uh, one complicated differential equation in uh, 26 uh, differential equation. Actually here, uh, for some reasons that I won't go to, uh, they have the same form, so we actually need to find uh, 26 solution to the same equation. They look a lot like the Hartree equation for it, uh, each of them. So you see there is a quantum kinetic energy term for you know, the electron that sits in orbital phi lambda. There is an external potential. There is a Hartree term. You see this is uh, the charge density rho mu. So there is the Coulombic repulsion from all the electrons. But now note the sum is not done on all other electrons, so, but it's done on all the electrons. So, so mu here doesn't skip lambda, goes from 1 to 26. So oddly, you would say electron lambda fills also the Coulombic repulsion with itself because phi lambda in that sum fills the Coulombic repulsion from its own charge density. Uh, that's what we would call a self-interaction that become very important on Friday. But in reality, uh, what happens is that uh, in going from Hartree to Hartree Fock, uh, derivation is much more complex. So we have uh, an extra fourth uh, term that is called uh, the exchange term. So this is now called uh, the Hartree term. Note that the Hartree term in Hartree Fock uh, is uh, uh, slightly different from the Hartree term in Hartree because in this uh, sum over mu, uh, in Hartree equations, so we skipped. Uh, uh, the electron that you know we were solving for here, we don't skip it, uh, but actually we have an additional entire term that is called uh, exchange. is a little bit weird. This is why these are integral differential equations. You see, the phi lambda has gone inside uh, the integral, but there is a minus sign, and so that's what's very important. You see that uh, when in this second sum in the exchange term mu is equal to lambda. Uh, that cancels out exactly the Hartree self-interaction. So actually, the electron doesn't look, doesn't physically interact with itself. It's just that its self-interaction present in the Hartree is actually later on cancelled out by the exchange term. So now these Hartree-Fock equations uh, satisfy this fundamental total anti-symmetry of the wave function. Much, much better approximation. And that way you can do a living out of this. So that is, uh, they are uh, good or very good. They can describe atoms very well. They can describe molecules. Um, atoms, I think, you know, accurately and extensively were described for the first time uh, by uh, Clementi and Roetti at um, IBM uh, in the United States in the early 70s. So you could uh, buy, you know, beautiful book of numbers that were the Clementi Roetti tables uh, with. Uh, all the Hartree Fock solutions are for the periodic table. And in general, you know, these Hartree Fock equations are so good 
uh, that actually you can not only describe, let's say, atoms and molecules uh, quite well, but they can be the starting point uh, for more uh, complex uh, treatment uh, that we will not go into, and that's uh, the entire field of quantum chemistry. You could go into muller plesse perturbation theory. You know, they published on Physical Review, the APS, so they got all those uh, citations, and you have uh, MP2, MP3, MP4. Suddenly, they are not variational of these additions, so you can go uh, below the exact uh, uh, total energy. Here in Hartree, because there is the variational principle, the hartree fock energy is going to be, at the very best, uh, equal to the exact energy, and in general, will be some little bit amount above. So, in general, the hartree fock energy will be greater of uh, equal than the exact energy, and that's why we call the difference between these two, this is a definition, the correlation energy. So the correlation energy is the energy that comes from all the beyond the archery fog uh, chemistry that is, uh, uh, you know, in the exact solution, but is not uh, in the archery fog, uh, in the archery fog solution. So, as I said, you could have Muller plus uh, perturbation theory. Uh, you could have uh, more complex and very powerful approaches, uh, like a couple of clusters, uh, where you have uh, systematic ways of uh, introducing uh, multi-determinant solution. You could have uh, uh, full configuration interaction. Um, what sort of, uh, you know, makes these techniques uh, uh, beautiful but tricky is that they become very expensive very fast. Uh, one, quantity that is very important to keep in mind is the order of uh, scaling. And uh, if you take, uh, say, a hartree fock uh, equation, uh, well, we won't go into the detail of why, but uh, it scales as the fourth uh, power of uh, your system size. So it means that uh, if you double the size of your system, you study two iron atoms instead of one, uh, the calculation becomes uh, 16 times more expensive. And uh, more accurate techniques, uh, scale as the fifth, the sixth, the seventh power, or maybe even exponentially. So, um, you know, maybe you can do that uh, very well for 10 electrons, but not all the computers in the world are sufficient uh, for uh, uh, 11 electrons. Uh, um, for DFT, we'll see standard DFT scales as the cube power. We'll see it later. I, I saw a question uh, popping, uh, popping up. Now, this is also a, a great equalizer. If something scales as the seventh power, it means that uh, maybe what you can do on your laptop uh, is just a little bit less good uh, than uh, what, uh, you know, someone that has the largest supercomputer in the world can do. Maybe you can do 10 electrons and that person can do 11 electrons. Uh, but uh, in practice, it's very difficult to treat uh, complex uh, systems uh, with hundreds of electrons with some of these techniques. Although there is a very lively area that I will not go into of quantum chemistry of uh, better scaling approaches down to linear scaling or even sublinear scaling that try to go towards large sizes. Um, you know, our dream is to have accuracy and large sizes. So after having said that hartree fock uh, was very good, uh, I say, why do we need something else? Uh, well, the truth is that it's very good, but uh, it's still not good enough uh, for having the kind of chemical accuracy that we want uh, to predict a chemical reaction, to predict uh, uh, material properties. Often, if you were to study a simple elemental metal with Archer Fock, it will become an insulator. And so it's, uh, you know, it's very good, but often it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, not, uh, it's, uh, it's not good enough. And that's why I want over this uh, to go into density functional theory, for which today we'll just do the foundations, tomorrow we'll do the practice, uh, and uh, on uh, Friday we'll see what it can be used for and uh, what are its uh, failing. But uh, before uh, going uh, from Archery Fock uh, to density functional theory, I want to just uh, give you a little tidbit uh, that, uh, that I love, of a theory that is maybe much uh, uh, less known, uh, but that I find absolutely fascinating. And uh, for that, uh, I need to introduce uh, uh, reduced density matrices. Uh, this is, you see, the definition of the first order reduced density matrix. Um, in first quantization, uh, we take the integral of a uh, wave function times uh, its complex conjugate. 
uh, we integrate uh, around uh, variables uh, from 2 to n, and so we obtain uh, an object uh, that, in this case, the first order reduced density matrix depends only on two variables. Of course, you know, because of total antisymmetry, it doesn't matter that we integrate from 2 to n. We could have integrated from 1 to 4, skipped 5, and from 6 to 26. So this is the definition of the first order, and uh, the second order is now a function of uh, four variables, uh, and uh, it's obtained in first quantization integrating over all the others uh, minus the first two on uh, each, uh, each side. Look at this very carefully, because you know, what are the objects that you have learned uh, up to now? You have learned about uh, the many electron wave function, 26 uh, electrons for iron is already impossible to deal with. We have learned about the charge density. This is intermediate, it's a function of two or four variables. So, so in our uh, you know, old approach, uh, it would take uh, one million or uh, one English billion of data points uh, to describe this. And it doesn't scale with the size of the system, okay? Or it's a bit like the charge density. If we increase the number of electrons, the number of variables doesn't change. Of course, if we increase the size of the space uh, where this takes place, it increases, but just as the second or fourth uh, power. Now, the beauty of these density matrices is that you can write this expression. So you can write, actually, the total energy of a system in the presence of an external potential. You see this is the one-body term, and this is the two-body Coulombic term. You can write the total energy of the system as a functional of the first and the second order reduced density matrix. So to get the energy exactly, you don't need the Schrodinger equation. You can just evaluate this function. And, uh, you know, you can write a variational principle, you can minimize this functional with respect to gamma one and gamma two and find the ground state energy. So incredibly simple, and it failed, or mostly failed. I mean, I know that there are friends and colleagues uh, working on this, but what is the problem? So of reduced density matrix theory, the problem is that the functional is known, but the domain of definition of gamma one and gamma two is not. So we know that we have to minimize this functional, but we don't know how to move in the space of gamma one or gamma two. So this is called a representability problem. So we know the functional, but we don't know if we write an arbitrary gamma one or gamma two function of two or four um, variables, uh, that is not a physical reduced first or second order density matrix. And in particular, the problem is for the second order reduced density matrix. Um, it's not going to be a valid one. So while uh, you know defining what is a valid wave function is very simple, it needs to be Lebesgue integrable, you need to be able to integrate a square modulus over all the domain of definition, it needs to be continuous, and so on and so forth. For gamma one and for gamma two in particular, uh, we don't have uh, the conditions. So remember this, we will not use it, but uh, reduced uh, second order density matrix uh, is a little bit more complex than hartree fock It has an explicit energy function, but at variance with hartree fock the energy here is exact, it has a variational principle, uh, but uh, we don't know where to search. And uh, what we'll do in density functional theory is instead get a theory where it's very easy to search, but we don't know what is the functional. So here we have the functional, we don't know where to search, so we have a representability problem. In density functional theory, you see, we know that the functional exists, but we don't know what it is. We know how to represent our arguments, it will be the charge density, so we don't have a representability problem, but we just don't have the function. You see, that's life, you never have everything that you would, uh, that you would like. So let's, uh, let's move uh, to DFT, uh, and uh, to do that, uh, you know, let me make uh, some uh, statements uh, first, uh, that is uh, how, you know, sort of uh, to define uh, some uh, of the concepts uh, and the uh, quantities. Let's go back to Schrodinger, okay? Remember, in the Schrodinger equation, the only thing uh, that you need to have uh, 
to state the problem. Solving it is almost impossible, but stating it is very easy. The Schrodinger equation needs to know what is the external potential, where are your nuclei, and how many electrons we have. If I give you the external potential and the number of electrons, and you are uh, you know, better than Ramanujan, you're going to solve the Schrodinger equation for me. You might you know, not be able, but you know, someone in principle can do it. So the problem is uh, completely well-defined. And uh, because uh, you know, the solution of the Schrodinger equation, impossible in practice, but well-defined in principle, is there, so we have the wave function, and all the system properties follow from the wave function, uh, what we say is that the energy of a system is a functional, in mysterious way, through the impossible solution of the Schrodinger equation, of the external potential and the number of electrons. Now, I like impossible. Another guy that liked impossible was Enrico Fermi, and Enrico Fermi said, uh, well, you know, let's actually try to do something where we look for a function of the energy, not uh, as a function of the many body wave function, it's trivial, psi h psi, but psi is impossible, not uh, as the second order reduced density matrix, it's uh, easy to write that uh, energy functional, but we don't know where to search for gamma one, gamma two, Fermi didn't know because uh, reduced second order density matrix theory comes from the 60s, but he said, well, let's try to see, and that was very intriguing, if we can write an expression for the energy as a function L of uh, the charge density. And, uh, you know, he was uh, a theorist, but he was also an experimentalist, and he had a lot of practical uh, sense, uh, as opposed to his uh, friends, Ettore Majorana. And so he said, uh, well, okay, let's uh, see what matters uh, into quantum mechanics, and he had a feeling, you know, in quantum mechanics, what matters is the curvature, the quantum kinetic energy. What matters is the interaction of the electron with the external potential, you know, and uh, what matters is the electron-electron interaction. And he said, well, uh, let's try to find a functional that is able to construct these three different terms uh, from the charge density alone. Now, what is really difficult, you know, in the electron-electron interaction, a little bit like Hartree had done, you know, one could approximate those with electrostatics in a mean field sense, same with the external potential. The quantum kinetic energy is tricky because the quantum kinetic energy is the Laplacian. So it wants to know about the curvature of the wave function. But the charge density has killed the curvature. You know, the charge density, let's take only one electron. The charge density is the square modulus of the wave function. Let's take uh, the most remarkable case, a free electron, an electron that doesn't feel any potential. We know that uh, f of r is a plane wave, uh, e to plus or minus ik dot r. Well, you know, the square modulus of a plane wave is a constant. So the charge density of a free electron is constant because it's free. The charge density, the probability of finding it is equal everywhere. But the second derivative, the curvature of this, if we take, uh, you know, e to the i k dot r in r trees in atomic units, uh, e to the i k dot r, I mean, I won't do it for you, but it's just a one half k square. So a plane wave can have any kinetic energy in the world. The kinetic energy is one half k square. So if k is very large, the wave length is very small, the kinetic energy, the quantum kinetic energy is huge. If k is very small, the wavelength is very large. The charge density is flat, the quantum kinetic energy is very small. So the charge density has forgotten everything about the quantum kinetic energy. So how can you get the curvature of the wave function from the charge density? You cannot. But of course, you know, Fermi was not going to stop just because of this. 
And so what it uh, came out with is uh, something that uh, we'll see later, but uh, that we call the local density approximation. And it's a local density approximation for the quantum kinetic energy. So what does our friend here say? Well, suppose that we have a molecule, you know, this is water molecule. Let me actually get some water molecule. Yeah, and CO2 also dissolved. So the water molecule uh, actually looks a lot like a sphere, the electronic charge density. I mean, with a little bit of tetrahedral symmetry. And you wanted to, you know, figure out uh, what the kinetic energy of this object is from the charge density. So what is said is, uh, is this, is said, well, let's suppose that at every point in space here where the charge density is small, here, here, here. So at every point uh, in space, uh, we can uh, assume that there is a kinetic energy density that is the kinetic energy density of the homogeneous electron gas. So if we take uh, a gas of electrons that don't interact with each other, this is the Sommerfeld model. Okay, so they don't have Coulombic repulsion, they are easy, we can solve them analytically. The only variable is the density or the volume. Uh, so we can actually solve that problem and we can write what is the total energy of that system, that is the kinetic energy because they don't interact. They are, in a flat potential, it's homogeneous. And that kinetic energy density goes as uh, the power five third of the density. And uh, the LDA is here. This is the LDA. What uh, Fermi does uh, with his student Thomas uh, is that uh, he constructs uh, a energy functional, the Thomas Fermi functional, where uh, we have simple terms. Let me start from the last one. This is a Hartree term, is the uh, charge density electrostatic interaction with itself. This is uh, the interaction of the electronic charge density with the external potential. And it says for the difficult term, for the first term, for the quantum kinetic energy, what I do is uh, I, let me use uh, for the first time today, different colors, I'll use green. We you know, slice up uh, space. Huh? So the energy density here is going to be zero, here is going to be one in some units, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, three, two, one. And so in every one of these uh, infinitesimal uh, little cubes, uh, um, I have a charge density rho. And if that infinitesimal cube was part of the non-interacting homogeneous electron gas, we would know what would be its contribution to the total kinetic energy of the system, that would be also the contribution to the total energy, would just be the kinetic energy density, A times rho to the 5 third, times the volume of that infinitesimal cube that is B of R, dr. So Fermi integrates over all space, over all volume, uh, the charge density to the 5 third because it associates uh, to every infinitesimal cube a density that corresponds to the, uh, sorry, it associates uh, a kinetic energy that corresponds uh, to the kinetic energy of uh, that little infinitesimal cube of the homogeneous electron gas. Okay, very smart. Now we have a functional, you see it. Uh, of the charge density alone. So you throw in uh, the external potential, you minimize this function with respect to rho, linear scaling. So if you double the number of electrons uh, in the same volume, nothing changes computationally because you deal only with rho. If you double the size of your system, well, maybe the second, the last integral scale as the uh, square, but it's easy to, 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 to sort that out. Um, does it uh, does it uh, does it work? Huh? Well, you know, uh, it's a little bit like Hartree. You see, there is uh, the external, the Hartree kinetic energy looks not as good, and uh, in reality, it works even worse than uh, Hartree, uh, the Hartree approach. Um, what is uh, what is good is uh, that uh, it's as I said, inexpensive. It introduced the concept of depending on the charge density. 
Dirac, that was uh, very smart and half Swiss, said, uh, well, why don't we also add the relativistic effects, uh, sorry, exchange effects uh, through the, again, exchange energy that we could calculate uh, just from that exchange term. But the truth is that, sadly, it didn't work very well. If you take, uh, say, the charge density profile of this is, you know, integrated already onto spherical shells for the argon atom, Hartree Fock, you know, does a, a very good job in getting the shell structure of the atom. Um, Thomas Fermi, with the Dirac extension and with the Weizsäcker expansion of the kinetic energies in perturbative orders, uh, you know, they just get uh, more or less uh, the right uh, uh, the right uh, shape, but uh, and you know, so it's not a total failure, but is very far away from getting uh, the true physics or chemistry of the system. So great idea, it just uh, doesn't uh, doesn't work. So these were the thirties, and so now we have to jump. So Hartree Fock gets established, uh, Hilaris. Uh, with a lot of computer that were people doing calculations, you know, gets the energy to incredible accuracy using the variational principle. It gets, uh, you know, the energy of the um, helium atom to electrons, impossible to solve uh, analytically, uh, down to an incredible number of uh, digits, getting the 99.9% .9 of the correlation energy with variational forms of that. Uh, are uh, very, very flexible. And so that seems, uh, you know, the way, the way to go. Now let's skip to the 60s. Uh, Walter Cohn here looking very smug, having uh, escaped the Nazis, uh, first in England, then to Canada, then to the States, uh, goes in 1964 on sabbatical to Paris. And that's, I think, uh, you know, one of the important uh, messages that uh, you need to go uh, ideally on holiday, but in nice uh, places. Schrodinger went skiing, got the Schrodinger equation. Uh, Walter Cohn goes to Paris, I think he got the Basque, uh, and uh, he got uh, the uh, Hoenberg and Cohn theorems. I don't know what he liked uh, uh, most, uh, sadly passed away four, uh, four years ago. But there, with uh, a lot of time in his hands, uh, starts thinking, and together with his friend uh, Pierre Hoenberg, that is now at Yale, uh, they develop 1964-1965 uh, and publish these uh, two theorems. And uh, so now we get to the heart uh, of uh, today's uh, webinar. You know, Fermi had that the idea, but it was hand-waving. Uh, Walter Cohn does the theorems. And uh, he says uh, this. We know already that uh, the external potential and the number of electrons uh, you know, determine what the Schrodinger equation is, uh, that is, they determine, at least in principle, what are the solution of the Schrodinger equation, what is the ground state wave function. From the ground state wave function, we can get the charge density. So, in practice, it might be difficult, uh, but conceptually, it's very easy and very clear. From external potential and the number of electrons, we get the charge density. Walter Cohn demonstrates the vice versa. It demonstrates that if you have the ground state of charge density, that determines uniquely, trivially, the number of electrons because you just integrate it, but it determines uniquely the external potential it comes from, that is, the external potentials that thrown into the Schrodinger equation gives you a ground state wave function that gives you the charge density. This is essential because, you know, now there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. We don't have to talk about the potential, the external potential and the number of electrons to fully specify our quantum mechanical problem. We can talk about the ground state charge density. It's as good as an identification of our problem because there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. If there is a one-to-one -one correspondence, I can talk about my left hand or I can talk about my right hand that you probably see reversed unless you are behind me, no one behind. Uh, and, uh, and so they are interchangeable and equally fundamental variables. How does it demonstrate? I won't go through the proof. It's very, very simple. This is in you know, the way it was originally done. There are 
uh, more elegant uh, maybe uh, formulation of density functional theory that are based on uh, lib proof uh, more recently here uh, it needs uh, to still introduce uh, a representability condition for the charge density that is called the v representability that is says it needs to be a charge density for which uh, uh, there is an external potential of which this is uh, a ground state charge density it turns out uh, as opposed to reduce density matrix uh, second order theory that these representability conditions might be maybe difficult to formulate but in practice are not a problem again i will not go through the proof of this one to one correspondence but is a proof ad absurdum it says that if there wasn't a one to one correspondence you see it's very simple you, you know any of us could have come up with this sadly you know it was done already but uh, uh, it's uh, it's very very simple it says if there wasn't this one to one correspondence uh, we would get uh, to an absurdum uh, that uh, you know these uh, two energies uh, should be different uh, and equal at the same time and that's uh, you know the, the the agony the agony and the ecstasy of the entire problem that is uh, we focus uh, for a moment on a much simpler quantity like the charge density but we don't really have uh, a prescriptive theorem we have an absurdum theorem that just tells us that this one-to-one -one correspondence is true but it doesn't give us any tool uh, to actually work out in practice how we could do this. Not that it would be useful, because even if we were able to build the you know, external potential of which a charge density is the ground state, it would be still impossible to solve the Schrodinger equation. But the first step was done. The density has you know, become a legitimate quantity in quantum mechanics, is the basic variable. One-to-one -one correspondence with the external potential, it's equally good. Now, the second theorem. We are getting that. To do that, what Walter Cohn and Pierre Hoenberg do is that they define a functional. And this is, you know, the functional of the density, of density functional theory. And it's a universal functional because it's a functional that depends only on the charge density. You give it the charge density, it gives you this number. How do they define this? It's defined like this as it's written. For a given charge density, N of R, we know that in principle, the external potential and the number of electrons is uniquely determined. So, we have the Schrodinger equation in principle. We can solve it in principle. We can get the ground state wave function psi in principle, and we can calculate the expectation value on that ground state wave function of the quantum kinetic energy operator and of the electron-electron two-body interaction operator. It's all well defined. Charge density, Thanks to the first Hohenberg and Kohn theorem, gives me the external potential, the number of electrons. I have a well defined Schrodinger equation. I have a well defined wave function in the ground state. I take this expectation value, psi, T, V, psi, and that this is a number, F. This number is a functional of the charge density, N of R. Having defined this universal functional f of n, Kohn, with his Basque, I don't know what he was doing in Paris, I think I know what Schrodinger was doing in Arosa, um, writes out one more term in the functional. So he writes an additional term that is just the integral of the external potential times the charge density. So the universal functional f plus this external potential is, uh, again, a functional, universal f plus integral of external times n, and it proves, and that's super simple, we'll get to that in a moment, that uh, this functional, E, that is a functional of the charge density n, and you need to know what the external potential is through the charge density n, is always greater or equal than the ground state the charge density. So you can minimize this object uh, with respect to n, 
and get, if you are at the exact minimum of this object, the ground state charge density. So this is a miracle. He has rewritten quantum mechanics, not as a Schrodinger equation. So this is, again, 1964. It's quantum mechanics, not a la Schrodinger, but a la Kuhn, as an exact variational principle. You minimize this thing with respect to all the possible n, you get the ground state charge density. The proof of this is very simple because, uh, again, if you take uh, the ground, you know, the charge density, the term is the external potential, it determines this ground state wave function. That ground state wave function can be taken inside uh, the expectation value of psi h psi, and you have exactly the integral of rho times v external. Sorry, this should be an n times v external f of n. Great. So what are the good things? We have an exact reformulation of the ground state energy as the minimum of the functional that you see. It's super simple. The only catch is that we don't know what F is. That's a little bit of a big catch actually, because if we don't know what F is, uh, we can't do anything. And in fact, not much, to be honest, was done until the late 70s. Uh, we'll come to that uh, in a moment. But I guess like Fermi, you know, Kona was not one to stop at uh, such a uh, uh, small uh, detail. And, uh, you know, in this, uh, what, what happened is that uh, he had uh, a brilliant postdoc. Uh, he just graduated uh, in uh, Cambridge, uh, University of Cambridge. That's uh, the Cambridge that is in the UK. Lu Sham did a PhD in the Cavendish Laboratory. It was a great time. Uh, Brian Josephson was there, Fulkheim was there, P.W. Anderson was there. Anyhow, he goes, uh, uh, he goes to San Diego, joins uh, Cohn, and uh, you know, Walter Cohn tells him, uh, well, I have a you know, variational principle, what do we do? You know, we have uh, said that up to now that uh, you know, once uh, we have a differential equation, we build a variational principle, we can go back and forth. If we have a variational principle, we can build a differential equation. This is, you know, the Euler and Lagrange equations that correspond to the variational principle. The only catch is that we don't know, you know, the small detail that I didn't tell you before hiring you for your postdoc. So always ask for what you will do for your postdoc. And if your supervisor knows what you, you will do, uh, it means it's not a very good idea. Walter Cohn didn't know and says, well, do something with it. And so they came up with this uh, barking mad idea. That works maybe because they were, you know, very bright, very brave, or they were also very lucky. You know, the, 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 the history of good things is always a combination of uh, intuition and luck. So what do they do? Well, they say, let's talk about uh, some uh, objects that are not real electrons. We'll call them Konecham electrons. Okay, you can do whatever you want. So they christen this object. Konecham electrons. These Konecham electrons are distant cousins of the real electrons. That's why they are in light blue here. They live on the moon or on Mars or wherever, in outer space. And uh, in particular, these electrons do not interact. It's very depressing if you're an electron or not uh, interacting. So they can pass by and not uh, feel uh, each other. But the definition of the Konecham electron is that, uh, you know, they will uh, live uh, in an external potential that we call the Konecham potential, where these non-interacting electrons, for which is, because they are non-interacting, is very simple to do a lot of stuff. There are no two-body terms. Uh, in that Konecham potential, their ground state uh, charge density is going to be identical to the charge density of the interacting system. So I take my uh, water molecules, uh, eight uh, valence electrons, uh, 10 electrons all together. Suppose that I had solved the Schrodinger equation, I know what is the exact charge density of my 10 interacting electrons in the field of the protons on the oxygen nucleus, the eight protons, and then one proton for the hydrogen and another proton for the other hydrogen. Okay, now what we say is that uh, you know, this was the ground state of the true electrons interacting with each other 
in the field of the external potential. Now we build a different external potential that we call the Konechan potential. So the Konechan electrons that don't interact in that Konechan potential, they have a ground state charge density that is identical to the charge density of the interrupting system. Why is it greater to introduce uh, these poor cousins living on the moon that are pathetic and non-interacting? Well, because uh, they are, uh, you know, they might be pathetic and non-interacting, but they are smarter than the Fermi charge density because you can still take a second derivative of a non-interacting electrons and get something out of it. And so really this entire trick is uh, to be, um, you know, to find a better way to guess what the quantum kinetic energy of the system was. So remember, you know, we started with the total functional that is f of n that we don't know, plus the external potential, the integral times n. And uh, we try to make sense of this. And exactly like Fermi did, you know, he sort of broke down f in three parts. Kinetic energy for which he did a local density approximation, Hartree, and uh, uh, external potential electrostatic, they also do a breakdown of this F functional in three parts. So they have something that they don't know, F of N, and they break down into three parts, of which two are well defined, and the third one is what is left. So it almost looked like a you know, Las Vegas casino trick. You have something that you don't know, and they say, well, you know, now this something that you don't know is going to be equal to A plus B plus C, and I know what A and B is. But if I don't know what C is, one could say I haven't made any progress. So, you know, maybe A is an elephant, B is a car, and, uh, you know, C needs to be the difference between the uh, iron atom and the elephant and the car. So it's not much progress, but you know, they were very smart and uh, you know, they were capturing into A and B a lot of the physics and a lot of the chemistry of uh, the system. And uh, so what they did is say, well, you know, what we are going to do, we are not going to do the local density approximation for the quantum kinetic energy, but uh, we are going to say that, uh, you know, F, is broken apart, the F of the true interacting electrons, into three parts, where the first part is the kinetic energy of the impostors, so the fake electrons on the moon, the non-interacting electrons, we call that a TS. It's uh, very well defined for a charge uh, density. Uh, we, need, uh, we don't know yet uh, what the Konechan potential is, but if we have the Konechan potential, it's trivial, you know, uh, actually for non-interacting electrons as later determinant is an exact solution, you can try it. And so that expression for non-interacting electrons is perfectly well defined. It's not the true kinetic energy of the system, it's not the T calculated on the exact ground state wave function. It's the TS, same name, but something different. It's like pizza, for those of you that have eaten pizza in Naples, and pizza in Chicago, uh, same name, but two completely different things. T and TS, same thing. But, uh, you know, the kinetic energy TS, the Chicago pizza, was sort of getting at least the shape, the thickness of, uh, of the right pizza. So they have a well-defined TS. They say the second term, we call it the Hartree energy. And then, so what we have done is uh, the game of the three cards, F that we didn't know is equal to TS, that is well-defined, Hartree energy that is well-defined, and everything else that we don't know. So they've just shifted everything that we don't know into the third term, and they call the third term very evocatively the exchange correlation energy. Okay, so uh, now forget for a moment that we don't know what this exchange correlation energy is, but if we write the total energy functional that Walter Cohn had written, you see the first three terms, the TS, the kinetic energy of the impostors, 
the heart rate energy and the exchange uh, correlation energy, that is the part that we don't know. They represent F that we didn't know, and uh, the external time sign is what is in the second Hohenbergen cone theorem. We have made no progress. We have just shifted things around, and then when you get distracted, I'll put in uh, the, you know, the piece that is uh, missing. So we have a functional, explicit. Now you see we have the Koneshaam impostors. Here they are. Let me write it. I'm done in two or three minutes. So these are the Koneshaam impostors. But we can take a second derivative of these impostors. So they, they, they grab you know, a quantum kinetic energy much better than the charge density on Thomas Fermi uh, was doing. And uh, again, if we have the energy functional, uh, we can do the Euler-Lagrange equation. This would be the Euler-Lagrange equation for the original energy function where we have just kept F. If we decompose F in these uh, three terms, the TS, the uh, external inter inter the interaction with the external potential and the heart rate energy. So if we put uh, those three terms in this uh, Euler-Lagrange differential equation here, what we get is what are actually called the Koneshaam equation. These are just the Euler-Lagrange equation that corresponds to the differential principle. It's all when defined, you know, lo and behold, there is a, a Laplacian, Koneshaam orbital by Koneshaam orbital, impostor by impostor, a hart potential that is the functional derivative of the hart energy, an exchange correlation potential, that's the mystery, you know. It's the functional derivative with respect to the charge density of that exchange correlation energy that we don't know. So we don't know this, so we haven't made any progress. We have just to write something, but at least it's formally correct, and the external potential. So you see, we have a, a bit like in hartree fock you know, for um, the iron atom, we have uh, 26 equations, uh, that we need to solve, or the same equation for which we need to find 26 solutions. It's just we don't know what to do for this exchange correlation. 